I'm Mark Cutchell. I'm a board member with CFDM and a spiritual director. And all of us are so glad that you can join us from around the Puget Sound area and beyond here. I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Susan S. Phillips. Susan is an experienced spiritual director. She's a very popular teacher on the contemplative Christian life. She's a gifted author. Her book, Candlelight, Illuminating the Art of Spiritual Direction is on the reading list front and center for CFDM's direction program. And she's also written the book, The Cultivated Life, From Ceaseless Striving to Receiving Joy. Which of us wouldn't want that? And oh, by the way, on top of all of that, she's executive director of New College Berkeley, an affiliate of Berkeley's Graduate Theological Union in the Bay Area. I invite you now to settle in and listen for how story, scripture, and the turbulent times we're living in right now come together in exquisite darkness, discovering the gift in our crisis today. Susan, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mark. It's such a delight to be here with all of you. What, a, what an exquisite ministry Terry and Gwen are leading along with some of the rest of you. And I very much appreciated that time of prayer that Gwen led us in. So tonight, it's my honor to share with you some of my reflections on gifts I've discovered during the past 14 or so months. During this pandemic season, I have been amazed to see that contemplative times with other people have been rich and deep despite physical absence. You may have discovered this too. People have been thirsty to experience God and contemplative times with another person have breathed life into this dispiriting season. All the spiritual direction groups I lead have taken place on Zoom and most one-on-one -on -one direction sessions have been by phone. Embodied intimacy is missed, but interior intimacy has been augmented. Deep calls to deep in the roar of the pandemic. I've come to believe that this new intimacy is due to the vulnerability we're all experiencing during quarantine, held within the structure provided by contemplative listening and by God's all surrounding grace. I experience this with you here now. We're not able to be together in person, but we are together in the intimacy of Zoom. We're a community of solitaries, like some monks I know who live in their own private cells in a monastery, joined in prayer, though usually separate. During the pandemic, we have been in our solitary spaces, most of us in home, homes, our homes, and we catch glimpses of the private, personal space of other people through the wonder of Zoom. We're more vulnerable than if we were together. We're more or less relaxed than usual. Many of us are wearing slippers on our feet. We're relaxed in part because we haven't had to drive through traffic to be together, or for some of you, fly to a different city. In this vulnerability, we're open to one another in new ways. When I've met with people for spiritual direction this year, we've been isolated and sequestered. Our social skins have thinned. We've become more sensitive and reactive, sometimes in unpleasant ways. Having a person come to my door is rattling. Where is my mask? Is the visitor sufficiently masked? The social political tumult of the past year also has left our nerves more exposed and moved. Many of us, those questions have moved many of us to difficult soul searching. How does racism lurk in my mind and heart? I ask, many of us ask, how can I listen well to someone who holds political views diametrically opposed to my own? I ask, 
many of us ask. There are blessings in this vulnerability, these soul-searching questions among them. Being less defended also makes it possible for us to open our hearts more deeply to the Holy One and to allow God's grace to enter into our wrestling with some of these issues. Throughout the pandemic, many people have sought closeness with God through the conversational and contemplative art of spiritual direction. I know I have. It can be a lifeline in untethered times, as it has been this year. Someone else is willing to hear us in all our vulnerability and disorientation, and that person is listening for God in our lives, trusting that God is near. I've been so grateful for my own spiritual director during this year. When our conversation begins, I can ramble for quite a few minutes before I get to where the story begins to form by God's grace. As I relax into the contemplative experience, I find there's a remarkable spaciousness, which seems even wider and deeper than when we meet together in person. Over the phone, I feel my director right next to me, in my ear, in my home. I hear her breathing. With her listening so closely, deep feelings and images stir in me and are transformed into story as I share them with her and with God, whom I trust is ever present and feels more palpably so through my director's accompaniment. People I love have died during this year. I grieve the absence of those friends and also grieve the opportunity to hug and weep with others who loved them. Enforced solitude and my greater vulnerability augment my feelings, which can be piercing. Those feelings emerge in the stories I tell to my spiritual director. Storytelling and story listening are crucial aspects of our spiritual formation. With my spiritual director, I shape the narrative of my soul, of my life. Mm -hmm. I begin to see more clearly who I am in the context of a listening relationship that acknowledges God. The Indo-European etymological root of the word narrative is na, G-N-A. It shows up in the Greek word Gnostic and our English word knowledge. Narrative is knowledge. We discover who we are through stories, both stories received and stories told. Jesus was a storyteller and story listener. In Eugene Peterson's translation of Mark chapter four, verses 33 and 34, we read, with many stories, Jesus presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He was never without a story when he spoke. When he was alone with his disciples, he went over everything, sorting out the tangles, untying the knots. Jesus told stories and also elicited the stories of those around him, helping them to sort out tangles and discover how their stories are shaped by the presence of the Holy One and how the Holy One's story is given in a way that matches their experience and maturity. It's a loving relationship. In Christian holy listening, we rest in the greatest story ever told, the gospel story. And we trust that God cares about the stories of every particular person. Those stories often tumble out of us mixed with emotion and paradox. They are real and true, not polished and produced. Speaking them to another person can help us sort out tangles and untie knots. 
we may find that our experiences of isolation and loss during the pandemic are held in the loving care of the God who loved us enough to become human and share our joys and sorrows. During the pandemic, I've listened to many honest stories about desires and griefs. One particular story lingers in my mind today. A pastor who sees me for direction has been isolated in retirement and often depressed in quarantine, all alone and feeling useless. Occasionally, the directee, who also works with a therapist, experiences an ominous darkness. In our times of spiritual direction, I try to notice the whole truth, hope and fear, faith and doubt, desire and sometimes despair. This year that's happened in our separate solitudes, connected by faith, hope, and a telephone. One day the directee said, I'm enveloped in darkness. In the darkness, I find it hard to remember the ways God has been with me. In the light, I find God in scripture, nature, people, prayer. That escapes me in the dark. No sense of God. The darkness feels thick and heavy. I felt concern about the darkness and I knew it was real. I must acknowledge and not dismiss it with a theological platitude, I thought. What I said was, the darkness can be so painfully empty. It feels like a place apart from where you have often experienced God with you in the light. It sounds as though you're wondering where God is when you're in the darkness. And then there was silence. And then I heard a whispered, yes. And then more silence. I waited. And then I heard, I sense it now. It's an exquisite darkness. And I just echoed, exquisite darkness. My mind went to Isaiah 45, verse 3. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. I didn't say that, but I prayed it. All I said was, exquisite darkness. The directee continued, Yes, as we talk, I know that it's dark. It's still dark, but there is a kind of light. There's a sense of presence. Very moved by this, I said, even in the darkness, there's light and presence. You're not alone. The directee said, yes. I just want to hold this in silence now. In the silence, I felt close to the directee who now was not fearful of silence and darkness. I felt close to God. The directee was courageous and honest in facing the darkness, experiencing its heaviness, and we were together in it, and God was felt. I listened to slow breathing through the phone and felt grateful. Holding our phones to our ears, we were practically in each other's heads, as though my directee were pressed against me. I closed my eyes and rested in the rich, lively silence of exquisite darkness. During that particular hour, the spirit was tending to me as well as to the directee. My own story was that only hours before this conversation, a friend had called me in the darkness before dawn so I could be with her 
as she was with her dying father, also a beloved friend of mine. Because death was near, she'd been allowed into the COVID quarantined care facility. Following a long illness, her father had just breathed his final breaths. As I held the phone to my ear, I heard his daughter's breathing and weeping. In the darkness with my friend, as during the time with the directee, I registered exquisiteness, which the directee so aptly named. It was as if the other person, each of them, escorted me into a personal darkness, stopped there, and as we strengthened one another by our closeness, our eyes acclimated to the darkness as eyes do on a moonless night. Slowly, we began to see the pin, pinprick lights of the stars. We developed night vision, as it were, and felt God's grace descend on us in the starlight. The directee said that even in the dark, there was light and presence. That presence made the darkness exquisite. My directee's words carried God's grace to the depths of my own heartache over my friend's death. The word exquisite means of consummate and delightful excellence. A fine description of the Holy One, I think. And it's what I feel myself floating in when directees open their souls to God in my presence, even when they do so in lament. To see more clearly in the dark, it's best to douse our bright manufactured lights so that we can see the faint, steady light of the heavens the delightful, excellent, exquisite light. The pandemic has offered that opportunity. That experience counters the forces of the pandemic towards fear, stress, loneliness, and languishing. In our relationships with others and ourselves, we can choose to move away from false light from our bright sighting stories and only half-believed affirmations, which would deny the reality of suffering. And then, and only then, we just might acclimate to the darkness and begin to see the faint light, the light that penetrates the darkness and is not overcome. This experience of exquisite darkness can happen in solitude but even more profoundly, it's experienced with the right kind of accompaniment. In her later years, my precious mother, now no longer with us, used to speak of solitary splendor. During her few times alone at home, she felt herself expanding into silence and thoroughly enjoying it. She spoke to God, sometimes aloud, from time to time, she and I would talk on the phone while she basked in solitary splendor. She said that talking with me about her joy deepened it. We savored it together. The companionship made each of our solitudes even more splendid. During the pandemic, my mother's experience has come to mind because in connecting with other people by phone or Zoom, we create a dyad or a community of solitaries as we are now. If we are trusting, vulnerable, and trustworthy, that experience can be full of grace. The historian Tom Rees has used a German word that has stayed with me since I read it. The word is Zweinsenkeit and simply means dual solitude but Reese defined it as grace-filled dual solitude, and I like that. My guess is that Reese was influenced by the German poet Rainier Maria Rilke. In letters to a young poet, Rilke wrote about a mature form of love, which consists in this, that two solitudes protect 
and border and greet each other. The loving, garden, guarding attention of another meets us in our solitude. The word border makes me imagine a sheltered place of dual solitude. And that's what I've experienced by phone and Zoom in this quarantine year. When my spiritual director or a friend listens to me in all my unsettled, vulnerable honesty, there is a grace that pervades my quarantine solitude. I can move beyond the irritations of feeling so vulnerable and sequestered. That loving, guarding attention must be what Jesus wanted from his companions as he suffered in Gethsemane. We trust it's what he received from the angel. It's what I hope to extend to others, even as we move out of sheltering in place. Presence can make even the deepest darkness exquisite. We who believe in the God who is love and in whom we live and move and have our being theologically affirm the pervasiveness of grace-filled dual solitude. Even in the bleakest circumstances, night vision is possible and solitude can aid it. Henry Nouwen wrote of solitude as a place of tethering and reorientation, where we can connect with profound bonds that are deeper than the emergency bonds of fear and anger. We felt a lot of emergency bonds of fear and anger during the pandemic. And I think that even more, having a listening companion beside us in our solitude can help us discover our stories and feelings and give voice to them in that place of healing and reorientation, of untangling and tethering. The poet Robert Louis Stevenson described dual solitude this way. There's a fellowship more quiet even than solitude and which rightly understood is solitude made perfect. As so, as we tell our stories, are listened to and listen for God, we discover and we learn. Now in this pandemic year, we've learned many things about coronaviruses, contagion, vaccine development, herd immunity, variants, and the effects of quarantining and masking, about our social, professional, and even worship possibilities over electronic devices about our own psyches and how they fare in enforced solitude and the ever-present threat of infection. But we have also, to varying degrees and consciousness, gained the knowledge which comes from seeking and sometimes encountering the Holy One. Perhaps in the company of a listening other, we may have discovered the treasures of darkness and the one who calls us by name. That knowledge, while hard to express, carries authority and has staying power. Something in us has been changed. We are being formed by God's grace. For some of us, even with hardships, healing has taken place. The other person in a stance of love elicited our story and now cherishes and remembers it. The knots untangle a bit. We breathe more deeply, take a step away from what now one calls the emergency bonds of fear and anger, as we're heard, tethered, met. As we acclimate to the darkness, we may experience it as exquisite by virtue of holy presence. That was my experience with my directee who felt alone, depressed, and useless in quarantine. With that directee, I found that my own grief over my friend's death was whole and full, held in the steady starlight of God's exquisite grace, even as I listened to the person on the other end of the phone. Our stories, my directee's spoken and mine unspoken, mingled as we breathed together. Noticing God with us. This is what I've witnessed during the pandemic. Have you experienced darkness this year? 
Have you been accompanied during the pandemic and accompanied others? Hold those stories, tell them. Let them be clarified and untangled by God's grace. They are treasures we carry from the pandemic. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I was uh, looking online here at a, a definition of exquisite. It says marked by flawless craftsmanship or by beautiful, ingenious, delicate, or elaborate execution. And I think we experienced that from you tonight. Thank you. Are you open to a few questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a question here. Um, how do you see this gift of vulnerability being nurtured as our environments open again? And have a, uh, she says, I have a foreboding sense that it may be one of the uh, things that returns to normal. Excellent question and one that I'm asking myself, one that the people I listen to are asking themselves. We need to find ways of noticing what the gifts of the pandemic have been so that we can shelter and treasure and preserve them and continue to receive them going forward. So I was just before this time started, I was out at the mailbox. My neighbor was at the mailbox. She's in her early seventies, a professor. And she said, you know, as this pandemic goes on, I'm aware I'm ready to retire. <laughs> I just need more time by myself, more time to think, more time to write. So some people are making big decisions to hold on to those uh, gifts from the pandemic. And others are making small ones. Hmm. Big decisions and small ones. Thank you. Another question came up early on. You talked about uh, a lot of us wearing our slippers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the piece you can't see on Zoom. And I'm wondering, based on what you've said and how you've laid out so beautifully the darkness and the light and how they co-mingle together, what kind of footwear are we going to need as Christians to walk out of this darkness, yeah. at least this dark time that we're in, to use your analogy of footwear? I found that intriguing. Wow, that is a very fun question. Um, I think it needs to not be too heavy and have good traction. That's what comes to mind. Mm. But maybe some form of dancing shoe like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. There's a music, there's a song there. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question for Susan? This is your time. This is the moment for you. You can unmute yourself and uh, speak it out. Not all at once though. Susan, uh, my name is Katrina. Thanks for being with us. I'm just curious, um, you know, your book going from ceaseless striving to, to joy. And so with the pandemic coming or here, you know, when it hit, like what was most challenging for you? Um, it, you know, cause I'm thinking that you kind of have a rhythm of life that's, you know, not so uh, striving and everything already, but I'm curious, like, you know, what was like, what was the, just the biggest adjustment for you or most, most difficult? That's a very good question. Um, and I should sometime do an exam on the pandemic <laughs> and be more in touch with the whole history of it. I think initially there was a lot of scrambling because I run an institution, I was leading retreats, I was giving the plenary at an international conference. And so as an organization, we were learning how to put things on Zoom. Uh, my husband and I were trying to figure out how to, you know, turn the house into a um, studio. 
uh, so that I could speak for, for these different groups. Um, so initially there was that big scramble. I'm pretty introverted. So I adapted easily to meeting with people by phone. I already did meet with a lot of people by phone because they're, they don't live near me, but, um, so yeah, just adapting to that, trying to hold my own attention when there's no real visual change for hour after hour I had to learn how to do that. It got better with time. I found every time I thought the pandemic was coming to an end and then it ramped up again, I had to relearn a lot of these things. And my husband and I had to learn how to work in the same house. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we uh, claimed different rooms. <laughs> <laughs> we also got a puppy that helped with our feeling so alone. Mm -hmm. But now I know that going back into the world is going to uh, have similar challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, Susan, uh, somebody once told me once that tell your story in such a way so that in it others find their, a piece of their own. And I can say uh, in, with confidence, I believe that's happened tonight uh, among us. So thank you very, very much for being with us, for telling your story and for lifting us up into this time that we're in uh, to have new, refreshed uh, Oh, oh, God. Thank you. <laughs>